If you want to build a really powerful and really fun character for your Baldur's Gate 3 game, or if you just really like theory crafting about character builds, then you are going to enjoy this video. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, and yes, welcome. Here at D4, I specialize in creating characters for role-playing games. So whether you enjoy theory crafting about character builds, or you're just looking for tips on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am so glad you're here, so thanks for watching. My name's Colby. Now, for those of you who are new to the channel, most of the time I'm building characters for Dungeons and Dragons. And just in case you didn't know, Baldur's Gate 3 is built on the D&D 5th edition rule system, with a healthy heaping of changes to the rules by Larian, of course. But there are a lot more similarities than there are differences. Now, I think it's safe to say that I've kind of become known for multiclassing with my D&D builds. Of the 140 plus that I've released to date, most of which could be adapted for Baldur's Gate 3, sometimes with a little tweaking, the vast majority of those builds multiclass. The main reasons for this are, one, I think it's fun to approach character building like a puzzle and figure out how to put different pieces together to make something awesome. But two, generally speaking, classes and subclasses in D&D 5th edition are super front-loaded, meaning they get a lot, maybe most of their power in the first few levels. So more often than not, a character can get a big mechanical benefit by pairing two or more classes together rather than just sticking with a single class throughout their career. And so, to celebrate the launch of Baldur's Gate 3, I thought it would be fun to tell you about my top five multi-class builds. These are pretty much all adapted from D&D builds that I've done to date, but with some adjustments to account for BG3. If you like what you see, I hope that you'll subscribe to the channel and check out the other videos that I've done. Maybe you'll find a different one that you'd like to try out, whether for Baldur's Gate or at your D&D table. For today, I'm going to try to cover a build for any role or archetype you might want to try out in Baldur's Gate. So that means we'll do a melee damage dealing character, a spell casting damage dealer, a sneaky, skillful roguelike character who will also hit like a truck, coincidentally, a support character, and even a tank. So no matter how you like to play, there should be something here for you. Before we jump in, I've got to put out this caveat. As of this recording, the full version of the game isn't out yet. So while I've spent years actually playing the game since it released in early access, as well as dozens of hours additionally scouring the internet for every piece of info that I can get about how the game will be different between now and release on August 3rd, there's just some stuff that we don't know 100% yet. I will conjecture as little as I possibly can for this video, but know that there are bound to be some things that I end up getting wrong because Larian has decided to alter the way that something works for their game as opposed to how it works in D&D. Also one note, this video is going to be both for those new to D&D and my channel and for veterans of the game and or my channel. So I'll be explaining some things for the newbies, though I will be assuming that you've got at least a general understanding of the rules for Baldur's Gate and also highlighting the important differences between the two systems for the veterans. And for longtime viewers, I'm going to do this a little differently than my usual videos. I'm still going to go level by level until we've reached like our core concept for the character, but we'll be taking less of a deep dive and just kind of highlighting the main features of a build, glossing over stuff otherwise. <laughs> New viewers are like, this is the quick version of what this guy usually does. <laughs> Holy crap, get on with it already. Get comfy, people. There's a reason some of my viewers like to call me the Bob Ross of D&D. Either that or the Homelander of D&D, I guess. Anyway, I proudly present my top five multi-class builds for Baldur's Gate 3. I'm super excited to tell you guys about the sponsor for the video this week, Night Vision Creative, and their current Kickstarter project, Creed's Codex, Legends of the Psionics. You guys, this 5e third-party book looks fantastic. First up, you should know that, as of this recording, they're in Kickstarter and are already more than three times their funding goal, so this book is greenlit and is going to press. The only question is, will you benefit from all the goodies you can get when you back a project in Kickstarter? I think you should. This book is all about bringing psionics to your D&D game, not just in the form of the Psy Warrior and the Psy Knife, but with a whole new class, the Psionic, along with multiple subclasses. This class looks like something I would absolutely 
love to play, by the way. They are a martial class that uses at-will psionic abilities powered by psi points, so it's got a really great gishy feel, although they're not necessarily casting spells. I love it. Of course, there's a lot more to this book than a cool new class. You've got psionic themed spells, magic items, a new race called the Exocron, a new psionic background, some psionic villains even to plug into your game, new lore, and of course, gorgeous artwork. I mean, look at this stuff. I'm drooling. Now, one of my favorite things included in the book are the Paragon Paths. These are essentially new feats that are chained together. So you take a low level feat early on, but then take a more powerful one four levels later that builds on what you've already got, right? So for example, you might decide to pursue the Elemental Conduit Paragon Path, taking feats that let you do increasingly powerful things with lightning damage on your attacks. Or maybe your character wants to go down the Peacemaker Paragon Path. That's an interesting and unique choice right? You get feats that make you increasingly better at resolving conflict without violence. Not everybody's a murder hobo, and I applaud you. Anyway, I really love the flavor that this lets you add to your character concept. Now, as of the release of this video, you've only got about a month left to back this project before the Kickstarter ends, so please go check them out and give them your support. To get there, please use the unique link that I'm putting in the video description. It's a little too long to post floating text for. This is how they know that I sent you. Thank you. And a big thanks to Night Vision Creative. I cannot wait to see the finished product for Creed's Codex. I know it's gonna be awesome. All right, the first build that I wanna talk about is for those of you who like to carry a big weapon, make yourself hard to kill, and just blow everything to smithereens. We're gonna call them the Holy Warrior and it is a Paladin Barbarian. So in D&D 5e, Barbarians are one of the most front-loaded classes in-game. With just a few levels in Barbarian, you get a lot of power. The problem with Barbarians is that they notoriously scale maybe as poorly as any class, making it difficult to justify, at least from a mechanics perspective, continuing to take levels in Barbarian after you hit level 5 or so. Paladins, on the other hand, scale better than just about any class in the game, with lots of incentive at each level to continue taking levels in the class. So if you combine just a few levels of Barbarian with a bunch of levels of Paladin, you're going to have a powerhouse of a character that is both an immovable object and an irresistible force on the battlefield. Here's how I would build this character for BG3. First up, at level 1, take the race and background of your choice. I'm going to skip these things for all of these builds. As far as I can tell, they both tend to be more for aesthetic and story purposes than for a lot of mechanical or statistical advantage. There will of course be some exceptions to this, depending on your build, but all of the builds that I go over today should work pretty much equally as well, regardless of your race and your background. So for our starting class, we're gonna start off as a Barbarian. Like I say, you're super front-loaded with features as a Barbarian, so you may as well grab them early on. For your starting ability scores, make sure that you get to a 16 Strength, a 14 Constitution, and a 14 Dexterity. We'll worry about Charisma later. At level 1, as a Barbarian, you get to Rage as a bonus action, which is going to let you do more damage for the next minute when you make attacks using your strength and gives you resistance to all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. And in case you didn't know, most of the damage that you're going to be taking in the game will come in the form of bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. Now you can only rage a couple of times per long rest for now, but that will increase as we gain barbarian levels. And also, with how easy and fairly consequence-free taking a long rest is in Baldur's Gate 3, not to mention short rests, these mechanics where they're limited to a number of times per rest or whatever are going to be less of a concern for me in BG3 than they would be in D&D. As for equipment, just equip yourself with the best two-handed weapon and medium armor that you can find. Now at level two, you're gonna get Reckless Attack, which lets you have advantage on your attacks if you want to give your enemies advantage on their attacks against you. General rule of thumb, use Reckless Attack. You are a Raging Barbarian with more hit points than any other class. You don't mind getting hit so much. You are here to kill your enemies before they kill you, and Advantage is going to go a long way to help you do that. Since, in case you didn't know, it means that you roll two 20-sided dice to try and hit, and then you get to use the higher of the two rolls. This is a big statistical advantage. At level 3, we get to pick our Barbarian subclass, and the one that I would for sure go with on this build is Berserker. Berserker Barbarians get to make an extra weapon attack when they rage with their bonus action. And unlike in D&D, they suffer no penalties for this feature, which makes it incredibly potent. At level four, you get your first ability score increase or feat. And we're gonna take a feat, 
great weapon master. Among other things, this tells us that when we are using a heavy weapon, which we are, we can choose to take a minus five to hit penalty to do an extra 10 flat damage if we hit. If you do the math, and especially since we're going to have advantage on all of our attacks, this is going to mean a lot more damage for us on average. So take this feat and really leave it on pretty much all of the time, except for maybe against the very hardest to hit foes. You're just going to destroy stuff. At level five, we get extra attack, meaning we can attack twice when we take the attack action. And since we are a raging frenzied barbarian, we're gonna get three attacks every turn when we use our bonus action, which are all going to hit really, really hard. Now, at level six, we're going to wanna to start taking paladin levels. In D&D, you can't multi-class with paladin unless you have a 13 in both strength and charisma. The rumor is that Larian is removing ability score minimum requirements in order to multi-class. And if so, great. Take Paladin here without needing to respec your character. If that rumor turns out to be false though, we will need to respec our character here. And yeah, in case you didn't know, that's a thing in Baldur's Gate 3. You can respec everything except for your race as far as we've heard, including even your class, which feels a little crazy for veteran D&D players, but it's a video game, have fun with it. Even if this rumor does prove to be true and you don't need a high charisma score to be a paladin here, we're eventually going to want a good charisma score anyways. So for us, that's probably going to mean changing our stats to a 16 strength, a 14 constitution, and a 14 charisma with just a 12 dexterity. Now sure, this is gonna make us a little bit easier to hit, but I mean, we're attacking recklessly. We're getting hit a lot anyways. I care more about our constitution than dexterity since we take half damage most of the time, meaning that every hit point for us is kind of like two hit points for most other characters, right? Now in 5e, paladins get their subclass or oath at level three, but it looks like in BG3, you're gonna get it at level one. I'm gonna go ahead and just say, pick your favorite here, PYF. None of these oaths are gonna significantly alter how we're playing. They'll just give you a channel your oath ability that's gonna give you a little heal or a little damage buff for an ally, etc. At level seven, we would be a paladin two, and that means we get paladin spells. Now, there are some nice spells that paladins get access to, but Unfortunately, as a barbarian, when you're raging, you can't cast or concentrate on spells. So I'm just gonna grab stuff here that's handy outside of combat, like cure wounds to heal your allies, stuff like that. But you know what you can do with spells as a raging barbarian? That's right, Divine Smite the other feature that paladins get at level two. With Divine Smite, when you attack, you can choose to spend a spell slot to do an extra 2d8 of damage, and that increases by a d8 for each spell slot higher than the first that you spend. So 3d8 damage if you later use a second level spell slot, 4d8 for a third level spell slot, etc. Okay, now we're really blowing stuff up. Save those spell slots and those smites for your toughest enemies and just burst them down with glee. You also get a fighting style at Paladin 2, and I would probably take great weapon fighting for a little more damage. It's not much though on average, so defense might be a better option if you wanna just be a little bit tankier. But at level eight, I'm definitely going to respec my character. Like I said, barbarians are front-loaded. We really only need three levels in the class to get the best stuff. Now that we're level eight, we can change things up to be a Paladin 5, Barbarian 3. Paladins get the same features at level 4 and 5 as Barbarians do, the feat and the extra attack. So respecking here is gonna let us be further along on our Paladin path while not sacrificing really anything. So now that we're a Paladin 5, we've picked up second level spells and spell slots. And sure, I guess you could be a better support character when you're not raging with those second level spells, but yeah, we're here for the smites. At level nine, we would be a Paladin six, and that means we get Divine Protection. And this is probably more powerful than a lot of people new to D&D might realize. It lets you add your Charisma modifier to all saving throws for you and all of your allies within, I'm gonna guess, three meters, and that will do really great things for you and all of your friends defensively. It's considered one of the strongest abilities in all of D&D 5e by many people myself included. So from this point on with this character, you're probably gonna take a fourth level in Barbarian to get that ability score improvement so you could raise your strength to 18. And from there, just keep going Paladin the rest of the way for better spells, better spell slots, bigger smites, as well as some other nice support, utility, and defensive features. The build is super fun, really well-rounded, and hits like a truck. All right, build number two, the ninja. Holy crap, we're only at number two? <laughs> 
Trust me, I am moving at like the speed of light compared to my normal pace. Anyways, yes, my next build is actually the one that I am planning on playing for my very first playthrough of the full game. And it is for those who love to be stealthy, agile, and get the drop on their enemies to hit for big, bursty, surprise damage. But also for those who like martial arts and being a little bit of a skill monkey. I'm talking about the Shadow Monk Assassin Rogue combo. So yeah, if you are new to D&D, you might think that the rogue character would be the way to go if you wanted to play someone who was great at stealthing and picking locks and disarming traps and things. And you wouldn't be wrong, but if you want to do all of that and do really good damage, you might be sad to find out that your character would probably fall behind other builds damage-wise. For reasons I'm not going to get into here, generally speaking, even though they get sneak attack, rogues tend to scale a lot more poorly on the damage front than other martial focused characters. They really excel, however, in bringing lots of great scouty, thiefy utility, which is important in D&D and maybe even more important in Baldur's Gate 3, and most of those skills and utility rogues get early on. As for the monk, longtime viewers of my channel know they are my favorite class in D&D, conceptually at least. To be fair, they are kind of on the underpowered side of things in 5e, but I think they can be built to keep up with most classes, and Larian is reportedly doing some things to buff them. We don't know a lot about what that looks like at the time that I'm recording this, monks aren't even in early access. But I'll take whatever buffs they can give me. And yes, pairing Shadow Monk with Rogue is a great way to make the perfect ninja in this game. So at level one, I'm gonna start off here with a single level of Rogue. This is going to give you most of what you need for some nice roguish utility, including more skill proficiencies than any other class, which by the way, for the D&D vets out there, skill proficiencies tend to come up even more often in BG3 than they do, at least at my 5e table. Maybe I'm an exception to the norm here, but yeah, skill proficiencies are really important in this game for all things out of combat, which I love for the record. Now, as for our starting ability scores, just make sure that you start off with a 16 dexterity, which is what we're going to be using for our damage, as well as our roguish utility, a 16 wisdom, which will help our perception checks and our monk abilities later, and then a 14 constitution, everybody needs hit points. Now, as a Rogue One, we get Expertise. This lets us double our proficiency bonus in two skills of our choice that we're proficient in. If I wanted to be the most useful Rogue that I could be in this game, I think I would take Expertise in Sleight of Hand, which, unlike in 5e, is the skill that's used for picking locks and disarming traps, and probably Perception, which is what you need to find those traps and hidden doors, right? Now, Stealth is an important skill to have as well, but in Baldur's Gate, it's a lot easier to sneak up on enemies and surprise them than it tends to be in 5e. When you go into sneak mode, you can see which way your enemies are facing and whether or not you would be in their line of sight. So long as you avoid that line of sight, you can sneak up to them regardless of your stealth skill level. You only need to make stealth checks if you're actually in their line of sight, so it feels a little less important to have expertise there than it does in 5e. Now you also get sneak attack at Rogue One, which lets us do an extra d6 of damage once on our turn. Note to vets, we don't get to sneak attack with our reaction. So for us, we're going to want to be using a rapier here, which is the highest damage dealing melee finesse weapon in the game. But at level two, I would start down the monk path. Okay, like I've said, there's very little that's been confirmed so far about what the monk is going to look like in BG3. So I'm gonna be going off 5e rules here for the most part. At level one, the most important thing to talk about here is martial arts. This is basically going to let us make an unarmed attack with our bonus action when we take the attack action. So we're using our fists, our knees, our elbows, whatever. Now we get to use our dexterity for that unarmed attack, as opposed to strength like most characters, for both our plus to hit and damage bonuses. And here's one thing that has been confirmed thus far about monks in BG3. That damage is going to be a d6 for us, as opposed to the d4 of damage that monks get in D&D currently. This damage will scale with more monk levels as well. At level 3, we'd be a monk 2, and that should mean that we get key, which is the resource that monks use to fuel like their most important abilities. We get one key point per level. Rumors say that Larian might give monks more, which would be great, but we do get them back on a short rest. And again, as easy as resting is in BG3, 
I'm not as worried about running out of key points as I tend to be in 5e. We can use these key points to be harder to hit or to move more freely and quickly, or to take two unarmed strikes instead of just one with our bonus action, that's called Flurry of Blows. Meaning that at level three, we can be making three attacks per turn potentially. And that is wonderful. At level four, we would be a monk three, and that means we're probably gonna get a really cool feature that's called deflect missiles. This will let us deflect ranged attacks with our bare hands. And I wanted to mention this because for D&D vets, I find that ranged enemies tend to be a lot more common in BG3 than they are at my own D&D table. Making this feature and other features that let you say, close the gap on ranged enemies quickly, things like that, even more valuable than they are in D&D, in my opinion. But then we also get here our monk subclass, meaning that we get to be, yes, a shadow monk. Shadow monks are awesome. In 5e, they get to do things like cast some limited spells, putting enemies in darkness, or casting illusions to distract. And supposedly we're going to be getting a feature called Shadow Strike, though I'm not 100% sure what that does yet. It looks like some sort of teleportation that lets us attack an enemy that we teleport to, which is just so cool. At level five, we would be a monk four, and that means we get an ability score increase or feat, and we definitely want to increase our dexterity here, taking it to an 18, as that will increase our damage, our survivability, and all of our roguish utility, right? At level six, we'd be a monk five, and we get extra attack. So now we'll be able to make two attacks with our rapier and two unarmed strikes to boot, as long as we've got the key to spend, for four total attacks on our turn. Now, in D&D, monks also get at monk five a fairly controversial feature called stunning strike at this level that can potentially stun your enemies. When it works, it's fantastic, but it's often resisted by enemies. I hope to see a change to the feature in Baldur's Gate 3, but we'll see. Typically, at monk five is when we see an increase to the damage that our unarmed strikes do, so I'm assuming it's going to jump to a d8 here, and that's great, because that is the same amount of damage that our rapier does. That said, since unarmed strikes are not considered finesse weapons, we're still gonna need that rapier to get our sneak attack damage, right? Now, at level seven, I'm assuming that the upcoming shadow strike will be obtained at monk six, and that it will be worth getting. So let's plan on going monk six there. But after that, at level eight, I think I'd probably go back to rogue for the rest of my career. Meaning that we would be a rogue two and would get cunning action, which provides some nice utility. At level nine, we'd wanna go rogue three. And this means first up that our sneak attack damage scales to 2d6. A nice little increase. But then we also get our rogue subclass, our roguish archetype. And that means we finally get to be an assassin. Now, Assassin isn't in the early access version of the game. Assuming it works the same way as in 5e, it's absolutely the subclass that I would go for here. If not, I think a different subclass would work well too. It just would reduce the burst damage capability that we have. Because assassins should get the assassinate feature which tells us that when we attack an enemy that has not gone in combat yet, we have advantage on our attacks, and if we surprise our enemy, then every single attack we make is an automatic critical hit. You are going to be doing a boatload of damage here now with four attacks against a surprised enemy that all auto crit. So from this point on, like I say, I'd probably finish the game with rogue levels for some additional bonuses to sneak attack damage and some nice roguish defensive skills and utility. Unless of course, Larian gives monks some amazing buffs for their levels seven through nine, then go ahead and stick with monk. All right. For build number three, we can't only make builds for the murder hobos of the world, right? What if you like playing a Care Bear? You're a support character, a healer, a buffer. Don't worry, I haven't left you out. Now, at first glance, if you wanted to play a healer, you might think, I should go Cleric, right? Or maybe Druid. And you know what? Both of those options would be great ones for a support-focused character. But you know what class I think might fill the role of support even better than either a straight Cleric or a Druid? Yep, the Bard. A bard with just a teeny little cleric dip makes the ultimate support character in Baldur's Gate 3, in my opinion. So here's how I would build it. At level one for our starting class, yes, I'm gonna start off as a cleric. One great thing about clerics in D&D is that they get their subclass right at level one, which tends to offer a decent bit of power. And when it comes to being the best healer that you can be in D&D, that usually means that you want at least one level in life cleric, which is where we would start out here. There are several benefits for doing so. But first up, for our starting ability scores, 
I'd make sure to have a 16 Charisma, a 16 Constitution, and a 14 Wisdom. Charisma will be our most important stat on this character, since that's what bards use for their spellcasting, and we're going to mostly be a bard. Constitution's good for everyone, obviously, and the 14 Wisdom might not be necessary to multi-class with a Cleric in this game, but I still like having a good Perception skill and Wisdom saving throw, so yeah, 14 Wisdom. So, first up, at level 1 here, Life Clerics get proficiency in heavy armor, meaning we can don the best armor in the game and still cast spells. In D&D, you need a 15 strength to wear the best heavy armor, a plate mail, or you suffer a 10 foot move speed penalty. As far as I can tell, that rule does not exist in BG3. Each character has a carrying capacity based on their strength, and so long as your plate mail doesn't put you over that, you should be fine. You do get some pretty heavy restrictions when you are trying to wear armor that you're not proficient in, however, you can't cast spells, you have disadvantage on your attacks. So yeah, big no-no, and getting heavy armor proficiency is pretty awesome. So yes, equipment-wise, make sure that you put on some heavy armor and a shield on this character to make them super tanky. I wouldn't even worry about weapons on this one, personally. Just focus on using cantrips when you need damage. So yes, life clerics also get a bonus to all of their healing spells. It's a feature called Disciple of Life. They heal for extra hit points equal to 2 plus the spell level that you're casting to heal. So a first level spell would heal for an extra 3 hit points, right? That may not sound like a lot, but it really adds up. Best of all, the spells don't necessarily have to be cleric spells, just healing spells. That's important because even though we get cleric spells at this level, we're not going to have a very high wisdom score, and that's the thing that benefits cleric spells, right? Since you typically add your spellcasting ability modifier to the spell when you heal with it. Thus, at cleric 1, you're going to want to focus here on taking spells that just work regardless of what your spellcasting modifier is. The most important one will be Bless. It might not be apparent at first glance, but Bless is one of the best buff spells in the game. It adds a d4 to all the attack rolls and saving throws for those you cast it on, and statistically, that's just really, really strong. I would upcast this with a level 2 spell slot when I could, so that I could affect all of my party members with it. We also want to make sure to grab Guidance uh, as a cantrip at Cleric 1. It's one of the best cantrips in the game, at least for utility purposes. and having it available on your character to use, especially in your conversations, is just a really great way to help you make sure that you're succeeding on those skill checks as it adds a d4 to every skill check that you make. But at level 2, you're going to want to start down your bard path, and I probably wouldn't look back. Bards just tend to have a better spell list than clerics, letting them pick from some heal spells right here at level 1, like Healing Word and Cure Wounds, and by the way, there's no restriction in BG3 like there is in D&D on casting spells with both bonus actions and actions on the same turn. So you could, for example, cast Healing Word with your bonus action and then Cure Wounds with your action all on the same turn, no problem. But things like Tasha's Hideous Laughter and Sleep that bards get access to can provide Provide some nice control options that are also going to help keep your allies safe that clerics wouldn't get access to. I'd probably grab Vicious Mockery for a cantrip to use when you are not healing. It does a little damage and then gives an enemy disadvantage on their next attack, again helping to keep your allies safe. The quintessential bard ability though is bardic inspiration that we'd get at this level, and this is really just another super fantastic buff for your allies, letting them add a d6, which will scale with additional bard levels, to the attack, ability check, or saving throw of your ally's choice who you give inspiration to. Couple that with bless, and that ally is rarely going to fail, when succeeding is most important. At level 3 we would be a bard 2, and that means we get jack of all trades. This simply lets us add half of our proficiency bonus rounded down to a skill check if you don't have proficiency in that skill. I've mentioned this already, but yeah, in BG3 having good skill checks feels even more important than it does in D&D, and nowhere is that more true, I think, than in charisma-based skills. Things like persuasion, intimidation, deception, I feel like almost every conversation with another character in this game gives you options to try and use one of these three skills, if not all of them, and succeeding at the skill check will usually lead to a more favorable outcome in the conversation. Thus, it feels incredibly important to me to have a really good face for the party, right? The one who's going to be doing all the social interacting. And no one is better at that role than bards. So 
not only would this character be a fantastic support, they'd also be a wonderful party face. And Jack of All Trades is going to help with any skills that you're not proficient in, making you a pretty great skill monkey too. You also get Song of Rest at Bard 2, and again, this is a fantastic support ability. In D&D, Song of Rest adds to the healing that you receive when you take a short rest. In BG3, resting works a little differently. Long rests recover all of your hit points and resources, but you can only take two short rests per long rest in BG3 to recover some resources, some hit points. Song of Rest simply functions like a third short rest. You can use it once per day, meaning that essentially your party will have three short rests per day, and that's really fantastic. At level 4, we'd be a Bard 3, and that means we get expertise, just like rogues do. Again, it's fantastic for our skill monkey party face selves. On this character, I think I would take Persuasion and maybe Performance to double my proficiency bonus in here with expertise. You're definitely going to want at least one charisma-based conversation skill, so Deception, Intimidation, those could be options as well, but Persuasion seems like it comes up more often than any of them. You also get second level bard spells here, and I'd probably go with Detect Thoughts for some fun and useful out of combat utility, and Lesser Restoration to remove disease or a negative condition on the ally you cast it on. We also get our bard college or subclass here, and we're going to want to go lore. Lore bards get some extra skill proficiencies and a different way to use your bardic inspiration at this level. It's called Cutting Words, which is a nice debuff to use on enemies. It lowers their attacks, ability checks, and damage dealt by 1d6 for an entire round. It's sort of like an anti-bardic inspiration that you put on your enemy, right? And it can be a really nice way to help keep your allies alive. At level five, we'd be a bard four, and that means an ability score increase or feat, and I would just make sure to get that charisma up to 18 here for better skills and spells. At level six, we'd be a bard five, and that means our bardic inspiration and cutting words are both gonna go up to a d8 instead of a d6. And then we get font of inspiration, which tells us that we get our inspirations back now on a short rest, not just a long rest, meaning that we can use those inspirations all the time and should be, and that's wonderful. We also get third level bard spells at this level, and I'd probably go with some strong control options here, like fear or maybe hypnotic pattern or both. They're not quite as strong in BG3 as they are in D&D. In D&D, they last a lot longer. These only last two or three turns, but as often as not, that will be all you need to finish off the enemies who didn't get hit by the spell and then take on the ones who you're controlling. Unfortunately, both fear and hypnotic pattern require concentration, meaning no bless, but Oftentimes, removing multiple enemies from the fight for a few rounds is going to do more to help your party out than the bless buff would, so it's going to be nice to have options. At level 7, we would be a bard 6, and that means, I'm assuming here, that as a lore bard, you're going to get additional magical secrets. Magical secrets is one of the greatest things about bards. Typically, all bards get it at level 10, and it lets them pick two spells from any other class's spell list and consider them bard spells, meaning we get to cast them with our charisma modifier. Lore bards get to do this at level 6 as well. Now, at this level, those spells can only be third level or lower for us, so I'd probably take the best support spells that you can find that we don't currently have access to. I think that probably means aid, first of all, to both increase the maximum hit point total of your entire party, as opposed to just three allies in D&D, it works for everybody, and heal them all by five, which of course, for us, with our life cleric dip, will be almost double that at nine hit points. Really great buff and heal spell. And then, I don't know, I might go revivify. It might not be as important since, minor spoiler warning here, you eventually in BG3 get an ability to fairly easily resurrect fallen allies at your camp for a nominal fee. So if you decide to skip revivify here, I'd probably grab mass healing word for a nice group heal, or if you feel like you don't need more support and you just want to turn up the damage, grab spirit guardians, which is typically a cleric only spell and it's a great way to throw down some damage in a big area of effect every single round, yes with your concentration. After that point in the build, I just continue to put levels into Bard all the way until the end of the game, focusing on increasing your support and utility capabilities, which will be phenomenal on this character. All right, build number four. It's time for another spellcaster, but not just any spellcaster, a blaster, a blaster caster. Blaster. And in D&D, when it comes to blasters, it's pretty hard to beat the Sorlock. A Sorlock? Right. That's a sorcerer warlock. 
Wizards are great for having a huge spell list to do just about anything you want a spell for in the game. But when it comes to just straight up blowing things up with magical power, it's hard to beat the combination of these two spellcasters. Both of them are charisma based, so they synergize really well together, and they have the added benefit of making, yes, a pretty good party face as well because of the high charisma score, right? The thing is, as good as this combination can be, I think for pure blasting burst damage capability, adding a couple levels of fighter into the mix makes it even better. So let's get into why and talk about how it works. At level one here, I think I'm actually going to start off this build as a fighter. In D&D, if you multi-class into fighter after level one, you don't get heavy armor proficiency only medium. But if you start as a fighter, you get all armor and weapon proficiencies. This is going to do wonders for our survivability. Now, it's possible that in BG3, you'll just get heavy armor proficiency, even if you multi-class into fighter later anyways. But what you definitely won't get is constitution saving throw proficiency. This might not be readily apparent to newcomers, but if you are concentrating on a spell, and if you're a spellcaster, you should almost always be concentrating on a spell. They're typically among the best spells in the game. But if you're concentrating and you take damage, right, then you have to make a concentration check to see if you maintain concentration. And if you fail that check, you lose concentration on the spell, the spell ends. That concentration check is based on your constitution saving throw. So having proficiency in constitution saving throws, which fighters do have if you start off as one, is really great for any spellcaster. As for our starting ability scores here, I'd make sure that we have our charisma at a 16, our constitution at a 16, and then our dexterity at 14 for a decent initiative bonus and dexterity saving throw. For the equipment that you're wearing on this character, you're going to want to get the best heavy armor that you can, a shield, and a finesse weapon, at least at the beginning. We'll be dropping that later to just cast spells, but for now, you're going to need to hit stuff. Fighters get a fighting style at level one, and I think I would go defense here. This just raises our armor class by one, making us harder to hit. But then at level two, we're gonna start taking warlock levels. Warlocks get their otherworldly patron or subclass right at level one as well. And honestly, I don't think it matters too much which way you go here. I would probably take Arch Fey because I like the group fear or charm thing that they get, but go ahead and PYF, pick your favorite. As for the spells that you're gonna want at Warlock one, there are plenty of great options, but I want to focus on two. First up, Eldritch Blast. Eldritch Blast is commonly thought of as the strongest cantrip, damage-wise at least, in all of D&D. It's unique to Warlocks, and there are lots of great ways to improve it, as we'll discuss in a second. Second up, I would take Hex here. Hex is nice in that, among other things, it lets you do an extra d6 of damage every time you damage an enemy. It requires concentration and takes a bonus action to cast, but beautifully, in BG3, not only can you transfer it to another enemy with a bonus action if the one that you've got it on dies, but it seems to last all day. Maybe they'll fix this with the full release of the game, but in D&D, Hex only lasts an hour. So yeah, in BG3, super efficient spell. At level three, we would be a Warlock 2, and this means first up we get a second spell slot. That's really important because remember, Warlocks only ever get two spell slots, though they reset on a short rest. Also importantly, we get Eldritch Invocations at this level, which are things that warlocks get to give them some nice bonuses or to maybe enhance their spells. We get two and we want to take Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast. Agonizing Blast lets you add your charisma modifier to your Eldritch Blast. A lot of people don't realize that most spells don't actually add your spellcasting ability modifier to the damage they do. So this is a big and important exception, and it's one thing that makes Eldritch Blast so good. What's better? While most cantrips scale in damage at character levels 5 and 11, they typically just add another die of damage. So Firebolt goes from a d10 to 2d10, right? Well. Eldritch Blast doesn't go from 1d10 to 2d10, it importantly goes from firing one beam to firing two beams. And if you're adding a d6 of damage from Hex and your Charisma modifier in damage to each hit, you can see how quickly that's going to add up to big damage. Now, Repelling Blast is nice in that it lets Eldritch Blast push an enemy away from you when you hit them with it. And that could mean, at the very least, keeping an enemy away from you and your friends, but at best, off a cliff, or into lava, or into your ally's cloud of dagger spell, etc. At level 4, though, now that we've got the most important things we need from Warlock, let's grab another fighter level for Action Surge. 
My longtime viewers like to tease me about how often I take two levels of fighter in my builds, and the reason typically is because action surge is just so good. We can use it once per short rest to give ourselves two actions instead of one action on our turn, meaning that when combat starts, you could pick out the most dangerous enemy, throw hex on them with your bonus action, then eldritch blast, Action Surge and Eldritch Blast again for some pretty decent damage. Next level, when Eldritch Blast starts firing twice every time you use it, it's going to mean four beams in a single round, each of them adding Hex damage and our Charisma modifier to the damage. But wait, there's more. Because at level 5, we're going to start taking Sorcerer levels. That's right. And at Sorcerer 1, we also get our subclass. And again, I'm going to say pick your favorite here. It's not really going to impact what we're doing with our blaster damage all that much. I'd maybe go Draconic Bloodline to get a little more damage out of, say, our fireballs later. But you do what looks most fun for you. At level 6, we'd be a Sorcerer 2. And in Baldur's Gate 3, we get our first metamagic options. Typically, we have to wait until level 3 in D&D. So yeah, sorcerers get what are called sorcery points. We start getting them now. We get one per level, so we've got two sorcery points here. And then they come back on a long rest, so we only get to use them per day, right? That said, you can turn unspent spell slots into more sorcery points, or turn sorcery points into more spell slots. At this level, we also get a few metamagic options to choose from. They're all cool, but none are particularly important for this build, so PYF. But at level 7, we'd be a Sorcerer 3, and that's when things get really good, because we get more metamagic options, meaning we can grab my favorite, Quickened Spell. Quickened Spell lets you cast a spell that normally takes an action to cast as a bonus action instead. Now, Quickened Spell is more expensive than it is in D&D &D here. It costs all three of our sorcery points. But now, when you're in a fight against a really mean big bad, here's how things would go. On round one, you would cast Hex on that big bad and then hit him with Eldritch Blast. On round two, you go, you supernova, go supernova, using Quicken Spell to cast two beams of Eldritch Blast, then our action to do the same, then Action Surge to do it a third time, hitting that boss with 6d10 beams of magic that each add a d6 plus 3 from our Charisma modifier. Kaboom. So from this point on with this build, I'd probably just stick with Sorcerer to grab more metamagic points and better spells bumping our charisma with every ability score increase that we get. And that's the ultimate blaster. And finally, build number five, the tank. So most of you who are familiar with video game role-playing games are probably familiar with the idea of having a tank in your party. Someone who is built to be super durable and then has some sort of like taunt in their arsenal of skills that just forces enemies to attack them and only them, right? Well, guess what? That concept doesn't really exist in D&D 5e. There's no like aggro mechanic that must be managed. The DM essentially decides who the monster is going to attack and with maybe only one or two exceptions that I can think of, none of which exist in BG3, can you force an enemy to attack someone else instead? Now, I personally happen to think that this is a good thing for Dungeons and & Dragons, and it leads to more fun and interesting gameplay. But still, I really love the idea of playing a tank, a big, beefy, beefcake who tries to protect their allies, not by healing them or casting protection spells on them or anything, but who steps in with their big dad or mama bear energy and tries to get the enemies to attack them, making themselves as hard to kill as possible so they can withstand the punishment. I have fewer tools to work with in Baldur's Gate 3 than I do in the current version of D&D to accomplish this but let's see what we can do with it. All right, at level one with this character then, we are going to start off as a druid. For our ability scores, make sure you get a 16 wisdom as that will benefit our druid spells the most, a 16 constitution for better health and saving throws, and then a 14 dexterity again for initiative and saving throws, among other things. Equip yourself with the best medium armor that you can, a shield, and a quarter staff. As for the spells that you get at Druid 1, I would focus on support spells like Healing Word, maybe Good Berry, though it's been heavily nerfed from its D&D version. It only gives four berries instead of 10. It's still a little more efficient of a heal outside of combat than, say, 
casting Cure Wounds would be, but not by much. And then I'd probably grab Fairy Fire here to give allies advantage on attacks against enemies who fail their saving throw against Fairy Fire. It's what we'd use for concentration for now. But then for cantrips, be sure to grab Guidance, which is again so good for utility purposes. And then I'd go with Shillelagh. Shillelagh is really fun in that it lets you make your quarterstaff magical and lets you use your wisdom modifier to hit and damage with it instead of your strength. At level two, we're gonna get our druid circle, our subclass, and we are going to take Circle of the Moon. Now, Circle of the Moon is really different in Baldur's Gate 3 than it is in D&D, and it's all because Larian has drastically changed the way that Wild Shape works. For understandable reasons, I think, in BG3, when you Wild Shape, and all druids can at level two, you don't just get to transform into any beast of level X or lower, you simply get to select from a few different beasts. Moon Druids just get one extra choice when compared to others, and Larian has made it the strongest option, the bear. Also, Moon Druids can transform as a bonus action instead of as an action like other Druids. Now, when transformed, you can't cast spells, but you can concentrate on them if you're already doing so. You also get all of the beast's statistics and abilities, except for your mental abilities, your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. The best part is you get the beast's hit points, and when those hit points are reduced to zero, you simply transform back into your humanoid form. Bears have 30 hit points. So now you have 30 extra hit points with which to take a beating from your enemies. Also, more importantly, in BG3, bears have a very unique ability that lets them roar at nearby enemies to, yeah, essentially taunt them. And if the enemy fails their saving throw against that roar, they are forced to attack you. And thus, we have our tank ability. Moon Druids also get a new spell called Lunar Mend that heals you for 1d8 hit points per spell level spent to cast it, and yes, it's the only spell you can cast while wild shaped. It can be used as a bonus action, so will be a nice way to stay in bear form longer. But now that we've got our main tanking ability, I think at level 3 I want to get some barbarian levels. So we'd be a barbarian 1. Now, I will admit that maybe more than anywhere else in this video, I'm kind of on shaky ground here. See, in D&D, when you're wild shaped, you can still benefit from other abilities that you might get from your race or another class, etc. This means that if you're a moon druid with barbarian levels in D&D, you could still rage, granting you some additional damage on your attacks, yes, even in bear form, and more importantly, give you resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, meaning you'd take half damage from those attacks, right? Yeah, even in bear form. I am hoping and praying that Larian makes this work in BG3. Rumors are that they will, but we'll see. If it doesn't work this way in the full version of the game, I'd probably just stick with Druid to get more and better spells, and apparently the ability to wild shape into an owl bear at level 6, which might be an improved version of the bear, right? Now, you may be thinking, hang on, we can't cast or concentrate on spells while raging, right? Right, we can't. But if we truly want to be tanking, I still think going this route is the best option. Raging effectively doubles our hit points. And we still could use those spell slots to support our companions outside of combat or for utility purposes. And for D&D vets who might be thinking, hey, we can still heal ourselves with our spell slots when we're a moon druid. Unfortunately, the lunar mend spell that moon druids get is considered an actual spell in bg3 so i'm assuming that it's not going to work if we're raging in bear form in the full version of the game i'd love to be wrong there i hope larian fixes this and makes it so lunar mend is not technically a spell assuming it works though let's stick with barbarian for a bit here because at next level, level 4, we'd be a Barbarian 2, and remember, we get Reckless Attack, which gives us advantage on our attacks, but grants our enemies advantage on their attacks against us. Remember, we want our enemies to attack us on this character, and though I don't know exactly how the AI determines who it's going to attack, giving them advantage on attacking us might encourage them to. It certainly encourages my DM to attack me when I'm playing as a character who uses Reckless Attack. I know that much. So this could be a great way to sort of pseudo-taunt our enemies if our roar didn't work. Besides, we're still going to want advantage on our attacks anyways, since even though we're a tank, the best way to protect our allies is by, well, killing our enemies, right? 
At level 5, we would be a Barbarian 3, and that means we get our Barbarian subclass, and we would 100% want to go with Wildheart here. For D&D vets, this is BG3's version of Totem Warrior. So yes, as a Wildheart Barbarian, you get to choose essentially a spirit animal that will give you some additional benefits depending on your choice. And we, of course, are going to choose Bearheart here. Makes sense both thematically and mechanically. Bearheart is going to give us resistance to not only bludgeoning piercing and slashing damage while raging, but all damage except psychic. So now we will be tankier than ever. It also gives us a nice self heal called Unrelenting Ferocity that is not a spell, so should be usable in bear form. From level 6 onward with this character, I'd probably stay Barbarian to get extra attack, again assuming that we could benefit from that in bear form. Bears don't have multi-attack like they do in D&D. And then after that I would go back to Druid for more and better spells. If we can't benefit from extra attack and or the owl bear form is a straight up improvement to bear and will still let us like have a roar tanking taunting ability, then go back to druid right away. Either way, with ability score increases, we're going to be wanting to increase our wisdom here. So there you have it, people. My top five multi-class builds for Baldur's Gate 3. Importantly, you can respec your companions in this game, so I don't know why you wouldn't just pick your favorite four of these five and have a fully optimized multi-class party. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun making it. I can't wait for the full version of this game. As a reminder, if you liked what you saw, I'd really appreciate it if you would like the video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and tell your friends. But regardless, I love you guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a great day, a fantastic week, that you stay safe, and that you be kind, and that I see you again really soon. But until then, take care. Nothing really matters, anyone can see. Nothing really matters, nothing really matters to me. Anyway the wind blows. <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody called and they want their um, video's final image back. Sorry, Bo Rap, Freddie Mercury, everybody else, amazing, but I think the X-Men look even cooler. No, don't even say that. Well, don't say that. At this level, don't even talk about that. Oh no, low battery. <clears throat> My teleprompter's gonna die! Okay, don't talk about deflect missiles. Well, okay, I do want to talk about deflect missiles. It doesn't, don't even say that. Well, don't even say that. Well, don't even say that.